Welcome back to the BK Petcast. I'm Bryce. I'm Kenzie. And we're the creators of the BK Pets. We're here to help you enrich and extend the lives of your dogs and cats. And today we have two guests on the podcast. I think this is the very first time we've ever done two guests. It's always been a single person. So congratulations to you. But (laughs) today we have Zach and Jen from Viva Raw. And Viva Raw is, I would argue, the highest quality commercial raw food that you can feed your pets. You know, they specialize in their sourcing, ethical sourcing, using whole food ingredients, and a lot of really cool stuff. They're doing incredible things for dogs and cats. So Zach and Jen, thank you so much for being on today. We're absolutely honored. Yeah, thank you so much. We're excited to be here. (laughs) So for some of our audience, you know, I I can't think of a lot of our audience that doesn't know about Viva Raw because we rave about you very often. But for those that (laughs) might not know about you, can you kind of give us an introduction into who you guys are um, and how you got started into this specifically? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So um, I would say, so for both Zach and I, we, before starting Viva, we really had no experience in the pet industry aside from having our own dog. And that is basically the reason we started the company. So before Viva, both of us were working in tech. Um, and then it kind of happened around the pandemic too, where we were at a point in our lives where we we're kind of like, oh, what, what do we actually like have a passion for doing and what do we really like love? Um, so at that time we we're doing like homemade meals for Karoo, but also at the same time we we're like, this is a lot of, a lot of work. <laughs> um, and so for a while we kind of explored like pre-made options to see if like there's anything we could buy from the store, but nothing really was up to our standard. It was kind of like a little mushy, like we weren't confident in what was in the food so we were like hey like let's try just doing it ourselves like own the whole thing end to end like go which out was and source, naive in first source from the far- <laughs> local farms and you know make like a few hundred pounds of food and see how it goes and we actually started by like posting on like our local raw feeding facebook group like this is one of my core memories it was like over thanksgiving we like drove around north carolina delivering stuff to people like from the back of our car um So that's basically how Viva started, you know, I think um, things are very, very different back then, but it was enough for us to see just like how much people like wanted what the same things we wanted, essentially, like they wanted high quality food, they wanted, um, you know, it to look fresh, they wanted to kind of know where the sourcing was coming from. Um, And we kind of went from there, essentially, we took steps like baby steps, we moved into a commercial kitchen, Um, we bought some more equipment and kind of went from there in terms of like starting Viva. Um, got all very, very deep into kind of the whole world of sourcing and nutrition. And, um, you know, a few more things happened in between, but now we're here. <laughs> <laughs> so who was the first one to suggest starting a business before this even started? It was her? That's great. So Zach, Zach gives me, um, Zach gives me credit, but it's a little bit like, you know, like he'll be like, if it, if it wasn't for me, first of all, wanting a dog when we like, graduated college together he's like I would have so much free time I'd be traveling the world and now look what I'm doing you know but um very tongue-in-cheek yeah we had some other random ideas at the time for what we wanted to do but um I think we at the end of the day we just like yeah I would say okay so part of it is like I think uh, when we started Viva, like we were doing everything right in terms of making every batch of food and then shipping every single order out. And I think it, both of us probably underestimated just how manual of a process that was, right? So like, it's I, I guess like you know I can't think of many other things where you are lifting as heavy like all the time. And I can't just, even imagine. Like... And it's not like you're working with dried products. That's the thing. Is like it'd be right, so much exactly. easier if it was dried, but it's all. <laughs> fresh, heavy, moisture products. Yeah, so even when we were like shipping out, I think once one time we counted and we're like, literally when we were making the food to like when we shipped out the order, every single pound of food, like we lifted in some way, shape or form like 20 times. Oh Like from like gosh. packing it to like all the way to like every single one of our like FedEx UPS boxes were like on average like 40 to 50 pounds, right? And like lifting that and putting into the truck. So it was like, wow, that's a that's a lot. Of, so we, we were like, OK, you know, thank goodness we're a little younger, you know, right now. But like in, even in five years, we're like, I don't know how this would have fared. Wow, that's amazing. So what was the first facility like that wasn't your home? Like what what did, what was the layout? How big was it? Yeah, so what? I would say the the very first one we did was like a it was never out of our home <laughs> thank oh. goodness um but like the very first one we did was with it's called a commissary so it's basically like a shared kitchen food trucks and stuff will work out of 
um, that was just basically our first run. And then after that, we moved into a commercial kitchen with like a little bit actually more space. Um, and, and basically it was pretty decent. Uh, yeah, the space was yeah. decently sized, but we mainly, we just had to purchase equipment. Like we sort of knew that, um, and for better or for worse, we just sort of knew that we would get from um, a point of like us to producing the food to ideally like convince um like a usda facility to take our product in and like that's a whole nother story yeah i I definitely after you finish here i've got to hear that one (laughs) yeah so so we purchased i would say like a semi large grinder and that was like our saving grace because that that was sort of what carried a lot of it but even jennifer was like hand packing every yeah. single i think the three bag. pieces of equipment we got were like a large grinder we got it used off of some market not facebook marketplace but like at a used <laughs> but the equivalent <laughs> can you um, even buy that off and facebook then we got like a mixer like it's like people use it for like mixing dough and things like that and then we got like a sausage stuffer and that yeah. was um yeah we went pretty far with that (laughs) wait what was the sausage stuffer for for packaging um so when we first started we had these like stand-up pouches um and so everything was hand filled and like oh one of my one of my secret skills from back then was i know exactly how much two pound weighs by like the feel or look of it (laughs) oh it's a good party yeah (laughs) (laughs) i don't know how good i am at it anymore but like Um, basically I was on the packaging he was on like the grinding and mixing and then I would weigh things afterwards and check and all that stuff but I got pretty good at like you know being very accurate yeah it was like a waste of time if you like filled something and it was a little over a little under then you have to like start scooping it out and reportioning so she got like super super efficient (laughs) yeah my party trick (laughs) that's hilarious so tell me about getting into the USDA facility Mm -hmm. yeah that was tough um, I think from the beginning, uh, so one thing about like pet food manufacturing, some context there is um, pet food is under FDA regulation. Um, and then USDA is like the government body that kind of looks over human food manufacturing, specifically a lot of meat processing. So um, technically, and like if you're making pet food, you just have to be like FDA registered, but um, it's not very, there's no real like strict set of standards there. FDA oversees so much like pharmaceuticals, makeup, everything. So there's, that's a very baseline level of, of what you need to have. Um, so from the beginning, we always knew we wanted to, after we moved out of our kitchen to, or the commercial kitchen is to go into a USDA facility. But that was really hard because um, kind of when you say pet food to someone, they're like, you know, like, whoa, like, is that clean? Is that safe? Like, how will it affect- When you say it to the USDA facility. Right, because they're, they're making, like, it. food for human consumption. So um, it was definitely a long process for us to find someone who was willing to listen and be open-minded about it. Like, um, Zach drove all around North Carolina, visiting various facilities, trying to, like, literally, yeah. he would go, like, yeah. we would call some people, and then if they don't, re- like, sometimes they wouldn't respond, but if we thought they were going to be a good fit, we would like he actually drove to some of them yeah i, I like, made like hey, cold stops and like i remember walking into these facilities and being like hey like i i left you a couple of voicemails like a couple of emails and then literally the owners would like hide from me like they oh would just gosh. like yeah i just think that they were so um they just didn't think they wanted to do pet food i don't think they realized like obviously like now the facility that we're with i mean even that relationship like we spent like eight months on before wow. they finally agreed to like mm-hmm. take us into their facility because yeah. of just the complexities that they felt that there were. But I mean, now they realize like it's the same, if not, I mean, it you is know, higher The quality. funny yeah. thing is, like, is like the stuff we bring in. So the place we work with, they make sausages. Um, and the stuff we bring in, like, usually costs more and is of, like, higher quality than the stuff they're bringing in for, like, sausages. Oh so that's, that's like, that's something I, like, yeah. chuckle about internally. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So then what are what are both of your, like, what are you doing now? What are kind of your daily responsibilities now? Because I know you're, you know, we've talked about outside of this and you're definitely still in some of that production. But it sounds like some of it has been automated at least. Yeah, so um, we we got to like certain points in our business where we, I mean, ourselves became the bottleneck, and that's the way that we thought about it. So first, we got to the bottleneck of being can't we we just physically can't um, make like as much food as we want to like provide for for the world, um, and so that was a USDA facility, and then 
we were still honestly like the USD. We had this arrangement where the USD facility was sending it to our warehouse, and the two of us are still packing. Well, the it, was, it wasn't a warehouse. Okay. It was, a, it was, it was a like kitchen a, we were previously kitchen, working yeah. out of, and oh, we, sure. we just like used their freezer yeah. space. So we That's used their cool. freezer space, and we're still packing orders like Monday through Thursday, um, or sorry, Monday through Wednesday. Yeah, and shipping everything out, and then you know, our backs started giving and we were like, oh, we can't do this many orders. <laughs> and then that's when we like found, um, so we were in two warehouses now, one in North Carolina and one in California, and they cover the entire country um, wow. depending on where you're living, right? So obviously like shipping from North Carolina to California is pretty difficult, especially with frozen food. So we knew that we needed to be in two um, warehouses to make it happen. So uh, they're, they're really great partners for us. So now our manufacturers are sending the food to these warehouses. Um, and they're sort of distributing it, but on a daily basis, I mean, we still like are just two hours away from the manufacturing facility and go like every three weeks or so. Um, so even just for any sort of like new recipes, you know, any sort mm -hmm. of, I mean, we're like getting new equipment and stuff like that too, just, um, to make sure that we can keep up with, um, like the production. Um, so like, it's really nice because we've really enjoyed having such a close partnership. I mean, we really just taught them how to make pet food. Um, and they, I think that's really, really important. I think finding like a manufacturer who can be your partner um, in doing everything and understanding the importance of doing everything correctly. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's really cool. So we've heard a little bit about, I mean, what I think people can kind of pull out, what is the goal or mission, but can you guys just tell us what is your goal or mission with Viva Raw? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say, um, honestly, it kind of started out as just like us wanting to like, wanting to make food that we're excited to feed our own dog Karu because she is our baby mm -hmm. um but I think it that's that's definitely still like a big piece of it like just making stuff we ourselves are excited to be using and have, like really trust and have confidence in um and I think it's really also involved evolved to like just help people learn more about fresh feeding because mm -hmm. I mean it's it's definitely something that when people first get into it, it's intimidating. It's very, it's, there's a lot of things you could potentially try and learn about. Totally. Um, so we just wanted to make fresh feeding accessible. I think that's kind of our big thing now. And I think the other part of it too, is like along this journey that we have sort of taken, um, we've learned a ton, like, you know, even just from the beginning of when we first started um, with like our own batches and then sourcing everything and then having to like go up and sort of scale um, I think there are a ton of learnings along the way. And just because the nature of fresh feeding is so nascent, like there are a lot of sort of things that people don't know about the industry. And frankly, we didn't even know um, about like what it means to truly produce like, you know, really quality food or source in a certain way, or like what are the corners that people are trying to cut, et cetera. So I think some of this stuff too is like, as we learn about it, I mean, one of our <laughs> core things is that we want to be as transparent as possible with the community so that you guys can learn too as well um, and understand sort of like deeply like what you are choosing to feed your dog and what you should be looking out for. Yeah, well, and it sounds like, you know, there's definitely uh, kind of an unspoken thought process from at least USDA facilities as to what yeah. goes into pet food normally. You know, like you said, exactly. they were leery of, of you guys coming in because they probably right. knew what, what current pet food is already made from. So makes yeah. total sense. So then, you know, getting into some of your products specifically, what sets yours apart from other companies within your same realm? Yeah, so I would say um, it's probably like three things fundamentally. So um, I, I will mention, so we do have like a dog line right now. It's called our Complete Recipes. And then we have our Pure Recipes, which are sort of a base mix. So um, if you've heard of like Prey Model Raw or Prey Model Raw Ratios, um, it's based on that sort of like concept of 80% muscle, 10% organ, 10% bone. Um, but those we also formulate specifically. Like that's not just like random muscle, bone, and organ. That's like specifically formulated for the highest like concentration of like micronutrients as well. And those, so a lot of our cat customers use that with, um, you know, making sure that they're supplementing to make sure it's complete. Um, a little teaser is, you know, eventually we should have something for cats. Uh, and then cool. like for, okay. for dogs, uh, those are complete recipes. Um, but the two thing I would say like, you know, there are two fundamental things about like the formulation of the food itself. And one is the way that we source everything. So um, we look for specifically like no antibiotics or hormones ever product, which is a huge step above conventional because it means that the farms that we're sourcing from one is 
um, there's essentially no factory farming that is producing like no antibiotics or hormones ever because oh, the whole wow. goal of like factory farming is that you're putting as many, unfortunately, like animals into, uh, you know, like a feedlot, et cetera. And you do need to use antibiotics to make sure that, to be frank, like these animals, you know, stay alive until the end of, you know, the time at which they're going to be slaughtered and used for meat. Right. So for us, like going for no antibiotics or hormones ever means that, you know, like the farmers themselves are committed to providing a higher quality feed of higher quality standard of living and environment for these animals. Um, and then the other thing we look for is certified humane. So from like any sort of third party, um, what we actually find through our whole entire journey, which is really interesting, is like we know like so many farms that Whole Foods source from because it's essentially like the same sort of stuff that people are looking for on that side. So in you terms of like Whole Foods is in the store yeah, Whole Foods? exactly. Got right. It. So because they look for that sort of like humanely raised requirement. Um, so basically a lot of times we're talking to these farms and they're like, you know, like you're, we're going to have to give you like our whole foods volume. And we're like, yeah, please. Like, you know, like <laughs> it's really, yeah, it's just funny because that is the level of quality that we're looking for when it comes to sourcing. It's, it means a lot to us that the animals are well-raised and it does make a difference, you know, in terms of the quality of product that we're producing. Yeah, and then I would say that the other aspect is, um, we do formulate with whole foods. So it's a big difference in terms of a lot of like even just like kibbles. Um, you'll see and a lot of just like to some, clarify, you formulate with Whole Foods sources, not Whole Foods the correct. company. <laughs> yes, sorry, that is that is especially since I answered the other one. Yes, that is an important distinction. <laughs> so we formulate with Whole Foods sources, like Whole Food ingredients such as like mussels and like you know like kelp and ginger and like fish oil and stuff like that. Um, in terms of like making sure our recipes are complete and balanced. Yeah, so that is as opposed to like a, like synthetics essentially. Um, and we also made a conscious decision there to do that because we felt like Whole Foods provided, it's not, it's more, there's multiple dimensions of like nutrients and things like that. And like a whole food ingredient, like ginger, for example, compared to, um, to just using one synthetic that's like manganese. Um, so that was a very, again, like intentional decision on our part and made various things, mostly sourcing a lot harder again yes, for us. Um, but it's, it was also, it just came from a place of like, that's what we want our own pets to eat. And that's what we really believed in. Yeah. yeah. So and the, I think that just sounds like it goes back to, you know, looking kind of at the evolution of animals and saying they evolved, right. their bodies have evolved to eat these whole food sources, which is, right. you know, the top of the line that you can feed them now. So sorry if yeah. I interrupted you, Zach. No, no, no. Yeah, absolutely. That's correct. So in terms of just bioavailability and, and what is considered like evolutionarily, um, what these animals were eating, um, that is absolutely um, the, the way that we wanted to do things. And uh, I think like, I mean, you know, even when Jennifer was saying like funny things about like just difficulty with sourcing, like every single Thanksgiving, for example, like you've probably seen that there are like organic cranberries in our food. Every single Thanksgiving, we have to like load up on like tons oh, of cranberries that's because so interesting. they're not a year round, they're not a year round fruit, right? Gosh. So we actually have to, we, we source like, like, I think like last year we sourced like 20,000 pounds of cranberries oh my and like gosh. froze all of them. Right. <laughs> so to make sure that, you know, but even now we're running out um, and we're going to have to like, obviously like source more cr frozen cranberries, but. That's just like one of those little tidbits where sourcing does become more difficult when you're working with Whole Foods, but um, we absolutely think it's worth it. Yeah, yeah, of course. I just love too that you guys take the approach where it's to the standard of what you would feed. And I feel like that's a big difference in businesses nowadays, like especially with people around our ages, is we're like, I'm tired of hearing stories about and I mean, I heard it on TikTok forever ago, so who knows if it's real, but someone was an assistant to a person that was an executive at like a Tupperware company and they had a party at their house. And so this assistant brought like a thing to eat and it was in Tupperware and the person that they were an assistant to was like, do not bring that in my home. Like we do oh, not wow. use. And so, I mean, again, I heard it on TikTok. So it's just so refreshing to hear that like, yeah. you guys are like, this is what we would feed our dogs. Well, and I think that bleeds into kind of the influencer scene right now too. You know, you see so many influencers promoting products that are, you know, whatever it may be, but owned by the big corporations with products that do not have good ingredients. And it's like, that's exactly why we promote Viva Raw is because not only is it what we would feed our dogs, it's what we feed one of our dogs, you know, like it's, right, it's right. something 
something we believe in. And so we definitely commend you for that. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So what is some of your best selling recipes? Is there one that outsells the other? Are they all kind of the same? Tell us about yeah, that. Yeah, that's a hard question. They're all our babies. You can't think of it. I know, right? <laughs> um, but no, I would say like, well, one thing we do encourage people to do is like feed as much variety as, as they can a variety of proteins. Um, so most our recipes are pretty close with each other because I hope people are listening. Um, but I would say like just just in terms of kind of a few differences, like for example, our rabbit um, is is kind of popular because a lot of times when people start looking into raw and fresh feeding, it's like, I mean, some of it is motivated because their dogs are having like allergy issues or sensitivities or things like that. Um, so we definitely see a lot of people go for the rabbit and also the duck as well, which is one of like a more novel protein that usually works better in those cases. Um, the other recipe that we most recently launched that um, we're pretty excited to see do well is like our complete puppy recipe. Um, I think there's not many yeah. other raw companies with a puppy specific one and we can get into why we made it that way too. <laughs> but yeah, it's, um, it's really popular. But yeah, we, yeah, I mean, like we, like when we first started thinking about a, like, what do we feed for puppies? Like it was kind of not, it wasn't something most other companies were doing. So we had to like think whether it was really worth it for us. But yeah. now that it's out there in the wild and we see how many people like, really like it and really like how tailored it is for like specifically nutrition during growth and development like um i'm really happy to see that one do well too <laughs> yeah i love that so what is the difference between your puppy recipes and your standard adult recipes yeah so um one thing about you know what you'll see if you turn about you know turn around the back of a dog food label is i think like 90 five percent plus of the time you'll see like formulated for all life stages and that's your like classic given like you know formulated to meet afco standards for all life stages um that's your classic given that you know this food is complete and balanced um, and you can feed it to regardless you know a puppy or an adult or a senior dog um, but when we were looking into the details of this um, we just started to see how different the sort of nutritional requirements were from a puppy standpoint you know, as opposed to adults. So what you'll find is like in these recipes that are formulated for all life stages, they're having to exceed the adult requirements um, in some senses, like, you know, over supplementing in a way um, in order to make sure that it's appropriate for puppies. Um, so what we wanted to do was to have something tailored for adult recipes where it wasn't necessarily over supplemented and still, you know, was absolutely perfect. Um, and then also produce a, like a puppy version where some of those nutrients were at higher levels because they needed to be um, like, you know, just as an example, like calcium phosphorus, there's a really specific range that needs to be in for not just, you know, increased bone development, but, you know, a healthy amount of bone development, especially for like large breed puppies. But also there are certain like nutrients like zinc and copper and et cetera that have like higher requirements than adults. So we would be over supplementing if we just like produced one version. Yeah, I guess like, well, technically speaking, I, I don't think over supplementing is the right word here, but it's more like the all life stages, we felt like it was a one size fits all yeah. thing. And uh, yeah. yes, like you can use it for both. Um, but it just wasn't optimum for either. So we rather, you know, just make an optimal recipe for adults and then an optimum recipe for puppies. And then that also gave us the opportunity to add um, just like other like other ingredients for our puppy recipe that you won't find in our adult one. So um, because like as a puppy, for example, you have increased like need for like brain development. It's huge. So we had extra like EPA and DHA in there. Um, we added like apple fiber as like a prebiotic for kind of healthy, like setting up the gut microbiome. Um, there's like beta glucans, which is like a really cool compound found in like ye like mushroom cell walls and grains oh, cell walls cool. for like oh. immune system. So those are those like kind of special things we because we had a separate puppy recipe, we got to like yeah. put that in there. <laughs> yeah. And it sounds like it's, you know, you're kind of thinking of it from a preventative medicine standpoint, you know, not to call right. your food medicine, but it's kind of the idea that food is medicine. And so I really like that taking into account the immune system and all the things that a puppy might experience and just set them up for success. Yeah, we yeah, chatted with someone today uh, talking <clears throat> about the gut microbiome and the gut brain access and how we're going to have to kind of reach track and fix that with our dogs so yeah 
if we would have yeah. just had this puppy formula. Yeah, and Viva will absolutely be a part of that. So, a follow up question: do you, Is there um, space for a senior dog recipe, or do the nutrient levels not differ as much from adult to senior dogs as they do adult to puppy? Yeah, that's a good question. So I would say that there are no like published numbers from a senior dog perspective, like in terms of like AFCO or like, which is, I guess, like you could consider they sort of right now, I mean, own is a strong word, but they have like certain requirements that you need to meet in terms of being considered complete and balanced. And they obviously have a version for growth and reproduction, which is the puppy formula. And then they have a version for like adult maintenance. Um, But there are definitely, I, I think it's a really great point. Like adult dogs do often have like different sort of requirements and we also do hear about like common things in which like i would say like senior animals struggle with a little bit more like even for you know cats for example like kidney disease or like pancreatitis or things like that so um it is definitely something that probably we're we just been like trying to keep up with the recipes that that we're putting out but at some point yeah i think that it would be it'd be really cool to look down that route yeah super interesting so what age would you recommend somebody starts their puppy on the puppy formula Mm -hmm. yeah i would say basically as soon as you bring your puppy home you can start transitioning them kind of that's usually around like the eight week mark but um we do work with like a lot of breeders too um it's super cool there's breeders out there that raw feed yeah (laughs) Um, that's really cool and and yeah and some of them will like basically wean their puppies onto raw um, so yeah, it's like, it's never really too early to start. If you are like, for example, a little bit concerned, you can always like gently cook the recipe a little bit, but yeah, you can basically start them when you bring them home. Gotcha. And so that's a, another interesting point. Can you gently cook all of your recipes? Yeah, so you can. Um, we actually worked on this for quite a while. Um, so from a, and, and I, I, there's in the raw feeding industry, obviously, and in, in just the raw feeding world, everyone will talk about like, you know, the dangers of cooking bone, which are absolutely entirely valid. Yeah. What we started doing was basically like, you know, grinding down our bones so fine that it is the equivalent of sand. So wow. it is so fine that it is, you know, definitely okay to, and we never recommend say like overcooking it either way. I mean, just from a nutrient loss standpoint, we yeah. don't recommend like, you know, cooking for like really long periods of time or like baking for like two hours or anything like that. But we typically just say like, if you're going to gently cook, you can definitely do so two to three minutes on medium heat. You can still be pink. Um, You know, that's absolutely okay. Um, Especially for like picky dogs and during the transitioning phase, that just helps a lot um, in terms of getting them sort of acquainted. And to be honest, like the cooking does release some aromas um, that make it really appetizing. So (laughs) that's hilarious to the dog. That is usually. Yeah. yeah. Even to the, we, (laughs) Go ahead. You'd be surprised at the number of people who have asked, like, can I, like, literally, I remember this call I took last week where someone asked me, like, I'm so sorry, my dog won't eat this, but like, can I? And then we we're like, I mean, you could, but it'd be kind of gritty. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, how convenient would that be, though? I mean, I guess they kind of have that like Hello Fresh and stuff, but that's not even close to the same. It'd be so nice if you could just open up the pack, take a couple scoops, oh. be so convenient. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. Um, so. What are some of the biggest challenges currently facing your business? You know, we've talked a lot about how you got started, but like specifically right now, what's the big thing that you're going through? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say like supply chain is kind of, is challenging for us more so than I think other pet food companies or even raw pet food companies. And this basically goes back to what we were saying earlier about like our sourcing standards, Um, because like one of our key like requirements is like no hormones or antibiotics ever. And um, what that means is we mostly work with like medium sized farms and there, there has definitely come several points, you know, in working with these farms where they're like, Oh, I don't think I have enough inventory for you for your raw ingredients. And then we have to go out and find more farms. And um, so we actually like for each protein that we have, we probably work with like two or three farms Wow. Um, just to make sure we get what we need. Um, and also the fact that we do offer like five proteins and <laughs> we do seasonal items and things like that. So <laughs> it definitely gets like pretty challenging making sure we can get everything we need and that the quality that we're looking for. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> totally. So, uh, you know, you mentioned a little bit about 
the hint about the cat stuff, but is there anything else on the horizon for these <laughs> off? Yeah, no, the um the cat one is definitely, you know, it's been a long time coming. So hopefully we get that out within the next uh, month or two. Oh wow, um, and it's then... that close. Yeah, it is yeah, it... gotcha. <laughs> It's good that you feel like it's fast because for us, it feels like we've been doing it. For I mean, I'm sure we just heard forever. about it. So it definitely feels fast for us. Yeah, but I can imagine be here it was before a long you process. Know it. Right. Um, wow. Very and cool. And then, yeah. And I think um, one thing we like to do is we like to bring in novel proteins throughout the year, like a couple of times. We call them our specials, but um, <laughs> we'll see they're kind of like seasonal stuff when we can get them from the farms. Um, so uh, hope we just did lamb. We're kind of at the tail end of that, and then hopefully in like a couple more months after the cat recipe, we'll we'll have something new and exciting for you guys. <laughs> yeah, very cool. So, kind of on on to the topic of what's on the horizon, would you ever see a, a process of you getting into an actual store and like selling products within a store, not just shipping online? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, the honestly, the answer to that is like. Yes, but we haven't figured it out yet. Like the, sure. the, all the specifics of how how we'll make it work. Um, but even now, like we are in, I would say like what, like maybe ten stores. Like oh, wow. honestly, like that. yeah. So so these are just independent, like natural pet shops that um, we aren't going out there and like trying to get into these stores. But you know, they just find us uh, yeah. and like just from their customers mentioning and wanting them to carry something, so it's easier to grab. Uh, and then they reach out to us and then we offer um, something for them, specifically like our wholesale program. Um, a lot of it is just learning for us to understand, like, you know, do people like this if they're, you know, picking yeah. it up from a store? And thus far, it's been really, really great feedback. Um, so we do expect that we'll um, sort of grow on that front. But we probably need to be intentional about it in terms of how we balance like the like the direct shipping versus, like, yeah. you know, access stores. So. Gosh, I mean, like we were talking about earlier, stuff is just so heavy being fresh food. So that's just a lot <laughs> yeah. of weight to lug around and a lot of money tied up in that. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, shipping gosh, is, is difficult. <laughs> I bet. But how cool would it be to go in, and I'm not trying to predict your future for you, but to go into a store like Whole Foods and buy all these really high quality ingredients and then see raw, humanely raised or, you know, ingredients that are humanely raised dog yeah. food. It'd be absolutely incredible. So yeah, definitely would... wish you luck in that because that'd be cool. Cool. The Whole Foods, the Whole Foods sourcing, the Whole Foods formulation, uh, yeah. going to Whole Foods. Yeah, feels like we should just partner at this one. I know. Yeah. So Whole Foods, if you're listening, I'll give you their email address. <laughs> so you know, in terms of this process, you guys had to have gone. I mean, you've already told us a little bit, but had to have gone through some adversity. What are some of the biggest failures or hiccups that that happened along the way? You want to take this one? <laughs> yeah. So obviously a lot. Um, I think, okay, so one thing that comes to mind is uh, this is when we were still making all the batches ourselves in, in the very beginning. Uh, and we we're pretty, I would say, like new to sourcing um, in that regard, too, and like working with new farms and, and stuff like that. So um, at one point we did like we so, for example, we use lean beef trim. Um, so the lean points that we look at are like 85% lean or 90% lean. So like very lean, like ground or it's not ground, but basically like beef trim that is turned typically into like human grade ground beef. Okay. But we get it, we get it in like, you know, the tr natural trim chunks because we produce a chunky recipe. Um, but yeah, so when we sourced from this farm, we purchased a lot of product, like thousands of pounds of, of this, you know, like lean beef trim. And then when we started to work with the product, we realized really quickly that it was just not what we were looking for. I think there's a big difference in what you think of as like normal beef trim um, in terms of like the muscle lead trim that you typically imagine. And like this uh, supplier, they're basically providing a lot of trim that was like, I don't even know the way you describe it. It's yeah, like kind of so like, like sinew and like connected tissue. Right? tissue. It's like what, it's like, oh. it's, like lead, oh, it's, yeah. it's like essentially what, it's like that you have like 10% or 80 or 20% fat or something. And then, the other could be the other 90 or yeah, 85 percent could be anything be, that's not like that. you think it would be muscle but like oh, it can actually just be like tendons like connective yeah. tissue things like just that. not fat just yeah, only 20 percent fat yeah. wow i didn't even think about that 
Wow. Yeah, so... Yeah, and so that was, like, when we opened up our first few boxes, we were like, oh this is gosh. not gonna work, right? Like, it's just not gonna look we're right. We're not gonna put it into our food, like, we yeah. can't use it in our food, and that was kind of our first big, like, sourcing mistake and we just ended up like not being able to use all that product um and yeah i would say like this it kind of just like it was kind of our first big like oops like we now learned a lot about like what it's like to talk to meat buyers or like farms and things like that and actually explain what we want totally i think it also means that like i mean now for example like we get we get samples of everything like tons of samples of everything before we, you know, start working with our partners. Um, we, we get obviously like COAs and commitments to like, even just like levels, like for example, like chemically like X-rayed, like lean fat content ratio and wow. stuff like that. Right. Yeah. Like even COAs, for example, from our beef plants of like, you know, tested negative for certain pathogenic bacteria, right? Like that's super important for us as well. Um, so that, and, and a lot of these farms, like we also like, you know, visit in person to, to like get an understanding of like the type of organization that they are running. Um, so that's super, super important to us. And I think we just sort of, after learning that we sort of realized that we really, really want to know like what these, you know, partners are like, um, and how they run everything. So, yeah, absolutely. Well, and Jen, what you said about learning a lot through that, that's kind of one of the reasons we asked that question is because we're very big proponents of failure. You learn, you, you win or yeah. learn, you know, there's no losing. It's like you go through something like you said, ordering that. And now you know exactly what not to do next time. It feels time. like losing in the yeah. moment. Yeah, it, it does. Feels like a big oh yeah. Loss. It definitely feels like losing. <laughs> yes. And then you're carrying these heavy cases and throwing oh. them <laughs> <laughs> no, no, thank you. Also, like, before you started Viva, did you ever think, I think about this all the time with, like, having bold testicles in our freezer. Did you ever think you just know how to talk to a farmer or a meat manufacturing? Yeah. Like, did you ever just think? When you were in tech. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's, um, it's a completely different world. But also, yeah. it's been, like, super interesting. Because I, I feel like what we're doing is, like, we're learning something very very fundamental about like the way the world works which is like how does food get made mm -hmm. um like where does it come from like what are the things that people think about and all this stuff and it's like it's just so interesting that like now we walk into a grocery store and we see things like very differently yeah from, even like labels from like oh, when yeah, we used to sure yeah, yeah. It, so it means something completely different. <laughs> totally. You mentioned a little bit about your chunky recipes. I, I have two questions for you. Number one, I want you to kind of tell our audience why you decided to offer a chunky recipe. And then my second question is, how do you make sure that a chunky recipe is balanced in each package? Because with like a ground up recipe, you can just take, you know, X yeah. amount of ounces of that grind and throw it in there. Chunky seems like there'd be a, it'd be a little bit more complicated. That's a good question. So um, to your first question about like uh, why we make a chunky recipe, um, the, it sort of goes to the core of, you know, Jennifer talking about why we started Viva in the first place. And it was wanting to have this food that you can be 100% confident feeding to, you know, your dog, your cat, any of your pets, right? Um, and for us, like a lot of the factors of like what pre-made raw to us sort of represented was like everything was minced to so like it was so fine that you had no idea what was in it right um it could have been any sort of cuts uh that that sort of were mixed together and it's really really easy to mix together a lot of different things and make it look just like you know just meat um so what we wanted to do was basically show people the quality of the cuts that we we're sourcing for example um you know like using 85 percent lean or 90 percent meat like lean trim for beef, right? Like when we chunk up our beef, you can see like those muscles um, and, and those bits in those chunks and it's not like super fatty. Um, and that's super important to us because we're just showing you, you know, we're going above and beyond to source you these sorts of cuts for your food. Um, and that's also why you'll find that like our food is quite a bit leaner in, in general, like compared to other, you know, pre-made rolls um, brands, just because, you know, the importance is for us like sourcing super high quality cuts rather than just like throwing in like cheaper cuts in there. To, totally. Like, yeah. So, yeah. and then your other question was in regards to like, um, like uh, it was, it was for how, how do you know which each pack is like store is still completely yeah, balanced. Totally. Yeah. That's a good question. So one, one thing is that obviously for our chunks, we're chunking them up still relatively small. So I would say like they're like one inch cubes or so. Oh, okay. And we're mixing. Yeah. 
so we're so we're not talking like a you know like a like half a beat size of a <laughs> yeah exactly so that that is very important we chose a size specifically that you know as it mixes together um it would still uh, it would still be able to be mixed really really well and thoroughly got it um so that that is the most important factor the other thing is to, to note is like yeah you can have like you know really rare cases where maybe you have a little bit muscle in this pack versus another pack but um over time too like those sort of micro differences will definitely not be significant yeah totally great to know so speaking of the different types of recipes that's a great segue into uh what does your daily routine look like with your dog and i'm gonna add another <laughs> thing in there what recipe is she currently eating and what do you guys eat like? Oh, three-parter. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> uh, getting personal. So we crack over a bag of Viva. Just <laughs> yeah, I mean, so Karu, like our daily routine with her, she's she's around like five years old now, so she's pretty mellow. Um, we'll take her on like a quick jog around the neighborhood in the morning, and then she kind of has her breakfast and then like we'll basically sleep until lunchtime where she like goes out and like lies in the sun for a little bit she loves sunny yeah Aww. that's her thing she it's like she she it's like her outdoor sauna there <laughs> um and then yeah then it's kind of like well in the evenings we'll take her out for another walk she gets dinner and then she you know she mostly sleeps all day which is yeah she cares good. about eat and sleep <laughs> i feel like she's a really really mellow dog um, but, but we're thankful like she loves hiking and going outdoors um when we do take her out but she's like one of those dogs that you can sort of switch on or off or like be in those mm. two different modes depending on what you need for your lifestyle totally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Karu, what Karu eats, she eats everything. So she's not picky at all, which is great. Um, and for a funny thing for her is like, um, all the stuff she gets is basically like damaged packaging. So like uh, at our warehouse, oh. we have people like sometimes like inevitably loss. like yeah. yes, the packages get a little like loose or whatever during from from a manufacturer to a warehouse. Um, so they'll set all those aside. They're trained, like we don't pack those into you guys' orders. Um, and whatever she, what's on her menu is basically all of those, <laughs> yeah. all of those sorts of things. So packages. she gets a wide variety, I'm sure. It's a wide variety. Yeah, yeah. we give her everything, you know, whatever we can get. <laughs> yeah, yeah so, but cool. always Viva. <laughs> yeah, yes, she's always, of course. always doing Viva. Yeah. Um, and then what do we eat? Um, <laughs> I mean, I feel like this this is true for a lot of people, like, you know, who will be listening to this, but it's like, you know, we feed her a lot better than we feed ourselves. <laughs> totally. Um, <Yes>. Honestly, <laughs> for, like, we do a kind of a lot of pre-made stuff from, like, Costco or Trader Joe's. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. it's not, not like the, not like just straight up pizza or anything. Stuff's but, good, though. Um, yeah, but we, it's just, like, whatever is, like, frozen, we can easily, like, put it in the pan yeah. or, like, heat yeah. it up. We've gotten a little bit better, though. We found, like, a local, um, like, a like a local meal prep place oh, where they, nice. like, do some, like, sort of, like, home delivery type stuff, but uh, they actually are really good. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, we, it, it, and it feels, it feels a little bit healthier, too. I'm sure, <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. I'm sure. Absolutely. <laughs> so it's been great, yeah. So we've already established that you absolutely have no free time. So my next question is purely <laughs> hypothetical, but if you were to write a book tomorrow, what do you think it would be about, you know? And and it can be about the same thing, but I'm curious if you guys have any other passions or anything outside of the pet world. Hmm. Uh, what would we write a book about? I mean, I think like at some point I would like to do a little bit more traveling. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so if, if this is like a book I would write in like 10 years, maybe I'll like, it'll be some, basically maybe a travel blog. Yeah. But um, and let's see, if we had to write a book now, I think, um, you know, what we feel like is super interesting is just like all these little things about like, basically how like the food, like industry works, like how the meat industry works. I feel like, um, just through us like starting this company we've learned so much about like you know for example do you know that like a lot of the ground beef you're eating is actually beef heart you know we like call up oh, our, wow. our suppliers it counts, as, it counts as um okay not okay i would i would caveat that a little bit it depends on who you're buying from of course sure I mean, but you don't not know. everyone is doing yeah, yeah but it, basically you can um so we found out because we're sourcing beef heart right obviously for our recipes 
um, and it's really great and nutrient dense. But of course, the mouthfeel is not quite there when you put it in like a burger patty. Yeah. Um, but you can actually sell ground beef with uh, by putting like beef heart in it because you can just call it like it's considered meat. Yeah, totally. Um, it like honestly makes me feel a little bit muscle. better about eating ground beef. I hope it's got some heart in there, you know, <laughs> a little extra taurine for me. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, that's just like something interesting. Um, of course, like there's, I, I think you're right. It's probably healthier, but it's like these little tricks that people are doing to like cheap for, for the beef industry. It's obviously like they're trying to cheapen up the blend. Totally. Mm -hmm. um, so, which is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's just so many little tidbits like that in our head. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm like, I mean, obviously, you know, we're very much in this world and didn't even know that. So yeah. I bet you guys have so much information that many people haven't heard before. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, that would be a book that I guess, like, at least you guys would read. Oh, yes. I don't know how popular it's not like a like a blockbuster like Harry Potter. It's just like, <laughs> we're not really in the blockbuster Harry Potter industry, so it comes to the territory. <laughs> so, just before we wrap this up, what are you guys consuming right now? Books, podcasts. Mm -hmm. What yeah, you listening to? Um, it doesn't have to be pet specific. Yeah, yeah. So one thing that like one podcast we started kind of listening to recently, um, it's called Limited Supply. It's like a book about well, a book? Is, no, sorry, not a book. <laughs> it's a podcast about yeah. um, kind of like e commerce. So oh. it's just they kind of bring on different other sorts of companies and talk about like their like journeys, like things they're doing, that kind of stuff. I think the interesting thing for us about that podcast, it is um, a lot of it is talking with people who are, I mean, I guess like in our world, I, I from the business side of things, there's yeah. a lot of companies that are venture backed and there's like bootstrapped and like this Can you podcast. Explain the difference? Yeah. So venture backed is obviously like you are funded by like, you know, venture capital or other, you know, means. So people are putting money into your business for equity and then obviously allows you to sort of kickstart things and grow a lot quicker, right? With those funds. Um, but as bootstrap companies, I think the things that we struggle with are that like we are more strapped for cash. Um, and we need to be really, really careful about our decision making to make sure at every single point we're growing in a way that is sustainable. Yeah. So totally. um, typically it's it's uh, it, it I think there's this conception that like it, it's harder to bootstrap businesses. But I think it totally depends on obviously the decisions that you make. But um, obviously Viva is bootstrap. Like for us, it's really important that we have, you know, control of our destiny and don't have, you know, I mean, to be to a certain degree, we don't want like business interests to sort of outweigh like the importance of the quality of food that we produce. Right. So that was a big part of like our decision making there. Um, and we honestly, I mean, as people philosophically, too, we just like don't want to be on someone else's timeline. Yeah, of course. <laughs> the right. That, so, absolutely. yeah. So, I mean, so this podcast is great because it, it is a lot of, I guess, like businesses who have managed to, I guess, bootstrap their way um through i guess the first couple of years and for us obviously that's super relevant because we always are looking for um ways that we don't have to like you know i guess like from the venture side you're spending a ton of money yeah right? so we don't have that sort of liberty yeah absolutely yeah and you know just to wrap mm -hmm. up things here i think first of all we greatly appreciate you coming on here and offering all this transparency and this knowledge and I think our, our community is going to find a lot of value in it. And I guarantee they're going to want to find you in other places. So what uh, website, social media, where can people find you and Viva Raw? Mm -hmm. It's just, it's Viva Raw Pets everywhere. <laughs> VivaRawPets.com. It's like our username on all sorts yeah, of social but media. Soon, I mean, depending on when you're checking us out, hopefully in a couple of months. So we actually recently purchased the domain vivaraw.com nice <laughs> so we're it's, super it's excited birthday gift. Yeah. oh cool what was, was it like a process to get that or did, you were not able to get it at first so it, it's funny so um it's actually owned by like um an, another lady who previously i feel like 10 year 10 plus years ago had the business and it's funnily enough like her business was like a vegan <laughs> like oh, Viva Raw is like, like, yeah, like a smoothies type of business. So it's completely different. Yeah. Um, but she just held a domain for quite a while and we just gave her an offer. And then we sort of 
I mean, probably we're overpaying a little bit, but we sure. really want the domain. So <laughs> yeah, that's great. Well, very yeah. cool. Zach, Jen, thank you so much again for being on today. Um, for anyone listening, we will include all of their information in the description below, um, as well as a coupon code to get started on Viva Raw if you're interested. But again, we so appreciate you being on today. It was great to talk to you both. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, of course. Thank you guys for having us. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much. And for everyone watching, thank you so much for joining us today. We so appreciate you choosing to spend your day with us, and we will see you in the next episode.